Well, good morning, and welcome to Mile Straight. We're glad that you're here today. Uh, in your bulletin, you'll find a study guide. If you'll grab that out, grab a clipboard and a pen from the book rack, and we'll get started. Today, we come to part three of our series, The History of Jesus. And over the course of time, the last two weeks, we've looked to see that uh, Jesus wasn't begun, or he didn't begin the time he came to earth. But in fact, Jesus existed from eternity past. We see that in verses 1 through 5, how Jesus is the eternal God, how Jesus is the creator, Jesus is life, Jesus is light. It's very specifically spelled out for us in that passage. Today we come, however, to a transition. It doesn't mean that Jesus is any less God. It doesn't mean that he's any less the creator, that he's any less life or light. But there is a transition that takes place. That we're going to see this happening as we study verses 14 through 18 of John chapter 1. So if you have your study guide, look at it, if you will. You'll see the verses listed there for you. Let's read these as, uh, as you listen, let me read them to you. It says, John is writing, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, and grace through, uh, and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the, Holy, the, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him, or has declared him to us. Today I want to bring you to a thought that uh, I think is just going to kind of set the stage for where we're going to go. You may later, if you're really into uh, diagramming out sentences and paragraphs and stories, you may come to me later and you may say, well, the, the, the title for the discussion today is badly worded. It's not really what you should have used because it doesn't really appropriately apply to the whole thing. But it's enough there that I wanted to bring it out. I want to show you a couple of things about name dropping that I, I don't think necessarily apply to John the Apostle, but I think are very appropriate for the study. So hang in there with me. I think you'll come to see what I'm talking about. So three things I want us to see. The first two are going to set the stage for the big finale, the big finish. Uh, so hang on with me. If you've got your notes out, I wish you'd do this. I wish you'd take your notes, but when you finish writing out your notes, please don't put them up. It is so disruptive to have those papers all over the building. So please hang on to them. There'll be a great time for you to do that when we get finished. I promise you, you'll have plenty of time to accomplish that and you'll still be able to get out before everyone else. So just hang on to that paper. Don't put them up uh, when we complete the notes part, okay? So where do we begin? Number one, I want you to see from verse 14 that John the Apostle sees what's inside. John the Apostle, now I specified the Apostle because he's going to introduce us to a second John for the second time in this chapter. But of course today when we begin this process, we see John the Apostle writing about Jesus Christ. And he's going to introduce the next guy in just a second. But we're talking about the Apostle to begin with. In verse 1, when we started this process two weeks ago, verse 1, John said, in the beginning was the Word. Now the Word, of course, he was referring to the person Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was in the beginning with God. So John is setting the stage in verse 1, showing us that God is eternal, that He wasn't created, He wasn't part of creation, but in fact was the Creator. We have the eternal God seen in verses 1 through 5. Now, the importance here is to understand that this eternal God is the same eternal God that he refers to in verse 14 when he said, and the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. This same God, this same eternal God 
became flesh. The Word in the beginning, the Word became flesh. Okay? It's greatly important that we understand this if we're going to capture the rest of the thoughts that John lays out. That the Word became flesh. It literally means to tabernacle with. To understand that better, it's as if we said, Jesus Christ left heaven, left glory, left the splendor of heaven to come to this earth to put on the tent of human flesh. Jesus Christ came here and clothed himself in human flesh. Now, that did not make him any less God. It did not change the fact that He is still the eternal God, but now the eternal God is also fully human, fully God, fully man. We may not be able to fully understand that, but just catch this, that God came to the earth and put on human flesh as a tent. It's really not so much different than what we have. The Bible says this life is just a vapor, and when this life ends, what happens? The flesh dies. The body dies. It's put in a casket. It's put in a grave. It begins the decay process. The body dies. But there is something that is left behind when the body dies, and that is the spirit of man. The spirit of man goes to live somewhere for all of eternity then. For those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will spend eternity in his presence in heaven. For those who have rejected him in this life and die in that mindset, they will spend eternity paying the price of their own sin in the lake of fire. Okay? So the body dies, the tent decays and stays behind while the spirit goes on to live. God Himself left heaven to put on the flesh of man, to put on the tent of man so that he could walk among us, so that he could live among us, so that he could be seen by us, be understood by us, so that we could relate to him. How important that part is. The problem is that so many people didn't understand this. John saw through to the inside. He understood what was there, that that was God in human clothes. But most people didn't capture that. Most people didn't understand it. Most people couldn't comprehend. They couldn't see beyond the flesh to see that this was God. Our studies last week, you may remember, revealed that, that Jesus came to those He created and they did not know Him. He came to those whom, who were His own kinsmen, to those who were of His own kind, and they did not receive Him. They rejected Him. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. But John saw it. John, along with the other disciples, apart from maybe Judas, understood that this was God. And John, seeing that there was something that was so different about Jesus from other men, knew that there must be something inside. It may not have been until maybe the Mount of Transfiguration that he understood this more fully, or more likely until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, did John finally comprehend, oh, wow, that really is God. It really is God. But eventually, John, along with the other disciples, came to understand that this is God. And therefore, John says, and we beheld his glory. Just listen to the passion of what he's writing. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John is saying in an excited, almost braggadocious way, we got to see the eternal God. We got to see God in human clothes. We got to see His glory. Got to see His glory. One of the reasons I talked about title being name dropper is because I, I can picture me in this situation or a similar situation. I can, I can just see me standing there with a group of guys after Jesus has been resurrected and ascended back into heaven. And I can see me standing there and saying, you know guys, uh, the last three years when I, was, when I was hanging out with God, you know, we were just like that. 
I was the one he said he loved. You know, we were really tied. I, I, when I was hanging, I really got to know him and I got to see, man, he was an incredible being. I mean, this is God. You know, we got to see him. We got to stay with him. We got to eat with him. And, you know, after his resurrection, he came to us. He called us to himself. And he, he said, I want you to know that I'm alive and don't doubt anymore. He told Thomas, he said, come over here and touch my hands and the, the scar in my side so that you know that I really am who I say. And we really got close to God. I don't believe John fell into that category. I think he knew so much about the risen Savior that he had experienced so much growth through this time with Jesus Christ that all of a sudden he would say, no, this is the eternal God. This isn't some person who just showed up on the scene. This is the one who has existed for all of eternity. The children of Israel got to see his presence, know that he was there, but it was shrouded in a cloud. And yet they were so afraid, they were petrified by what they experienced. His presence would hover over the tabernacle, but now, no more cloud. Uh, he came and talked with us. We learned from Him. We walked with Him. We ate with Him. We saw Him do miracle upon miracle. We, we witnessed the risen Savior. Huh. It prompted John to distinguish Jesus from all others. He said He's the only begotten Son of the Father. He is the one and only, the original. He is God Himself. John got it. When John looked at Jesus, he just understood. He knew there is God. And you know what amazes me is that that same amount of awe that John expressed in his words is what God wants us to experience as well. The same thing. God wants us to know Him so well. He wants us to understand Him so well. And you say, well, how do I do that? I can't see Him. He doesn't live here now. Not visibly. How do we know Him Right here. The Word. We get involved in the Scriptures. We make it a priority in our lives to where we know Him more and more and more and more. And the truth of God becomes real to us. To the extent that we can sit with John and say, I am in awe because I got to experience the Almighty God. Got to have that experience with Him. John saw what was on the inside, John the Apostle. But I want you to see, number two, that John the Baptist saw it also. John the Baptist saw it also. He sees, he sees the same thing that John the Apostle sees. He sees that this is God. In fact, John the Baptist sees it uh, way in advance of John the Apostle, I believe. In fact, John the Baptist was prophesying that Jesus was coming, that this was the Messiah, that this was the one who would bring forth salvation for mankind, who would present a plan, who would shine the light on God's plan to bring about salvation to mankind. John the Baptist was seeing that. Verse 15 says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. I, I believe John the Baptist was equally excited with John the Apostle when Jesus arrived on the scene. 
I mean, I believe that there was such a, an enthusiasm in his voice. Guys, this is the one that I've been telling you about. I believe there was a sense of fulfillment in John the Baptist's life when Jesus Christ showed up and he got to physically identify him to the crowd. This is the one that I came, I was sent to prepare a way for him. He's the one that I've been telling you about. And look, here he is. Here he is. Name dropping. Man, I could really fit into this. I could, I could really say, you, you, did you notice that God came to see me? <laughs> I mean, he came right where I was so that I could baptize him. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? God came to see me. Not John the Baptist. John unleashes a, a brain teaser, if you will, uh, some sort of a, a weird thing that he says. And had we not had an understanding of previous verses in this chapter, it could really be confusing. Because here he says, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He who comes after me in time was before me in time. And if we're talking about anybody else, that's a ludicrous statement. It's a crazy thought. He who was born after me somehow existed before me. That just doesn't happen unless he was a preemie or something. You know, it just doesn't happen that way. But of course, we know from verses 1 through 5 that Jesus was eternal. John was saying he was born after me, but he's existed for all of eternity. He is preferred above me because he is God. He's God. And John told his disciples when they came to him saying, John, you've got, you got to do something. Jesus is still in all the crowds. I mean, they were coming out to us to see us, to be baptized here by you, to listen to you teach. And now all of a sudden, they're going somewhere else. They're going to follow Jesus. you got to do something. And John said, wait a minute, guys. I've got to become less and less in my own estimation so that Jesus can become more and more. You see, John saw what was on the inside. John recognized that Jesus was God in a human tent. Well, this brings us to this final thought. And for me, this is kind of the gathering point. This is kind of John saying, okay, here's why I've told you all this stuff. He brings us to this to this conclusion of these verses. And so number three, John the Apostle reveals the meaning of it all. John the Apostle reveals the meaning of it all. Keep your notes out. Verses 16 through 18. John says, And of his, of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. I want to start with the last verse because I think it's important to the previous two verses. John the Baptist, as you remember, was sent by God to proclaim that Jesus Christ was coming, to prepare the way. John was sent to point people to Jesus Christ. That's why it wasn't, it wasn't crazy for him to tell his disciples, wait a minute, guys, I'm not the main character here. I'm not the one that draws the attention. I'm not the one who can save anybody. That's Jesus. That's the reason people are following him. It wasn't absurd for him to say something like that. John came to point people to Jesus. But Jesus had a different agenda. Jesus came for one reason. There's many, but one reason was to declare the Father. Jesus came to declare the Father. Now, who better to do that, right? 
no one on earth at that time had, had seen any part of God. Not that's recorded, at least for us. No one had seen Him. And in fact, for 400 years, God had been silent to the people of Israel. They had rebelled against Him so greatly that He just went silent. He said, you want to live like that? Okay, let's see how that works out for you. It's kind of what's happening in America right now. I'm so afraid that God is just pulling further and further away. So no one had seen God, but Jesus, it says, was in his bosom indicating the, the intimacy of their relationship, the closeness of their relationship. Jesus, who knew him best because he himself was God, he himself is God, Jesus, who knew him best, was so closely related that it was best for him to identify and to relate to us information about the Father. After all, it is the Word. The Word that now we study to know about God was the Word that Jesus was coming. It was the release of everything God wanted to tell mankind seen in the person of Jesus Christ, which is now conveyed in the Word of God. And so Jesus was coming to point people to the Father. Who better to do that than one who knew Him best? Jesus was coming. In the process of this, Jesus came to, to present the Father to the people through several means. One way was through obedience to the plan of God. God had laid out a plan. He had established a plan before the foundations of the wor world were formed. God already had a plan in place by which He would bring salvation to mankind. Salvation to mankind. Now, why did they need salvation? Because God had laid out a law, and he said, here's my law. Don't lie, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't commit adultery, don't to covet what your neighbor has. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. Love your neighbor as yourself. These things that God had laid out, he said, this is what you must live perfectly. Must live perfectly. The problem was that no one could do that. Some would break the law in small ways. Some would break the law in, in every way. But regardless, whether small or large, it was broken. The law was broken. The perfection that was required by God the Father had not been achieved by mankind. Man could not accomplish that. And as a result, God, knowing this would take place before the worlds were formed, set out a plan by which He would send His Son to the earth. He would send His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus would come, and Jesus, obeying the plan of God, would fulfill the law of God. How did He fulfill the law of God? He lived perfectly by that law. Never broke it. And Jesus fulfilled the law of God. Jesus, in fulfilling the law of God, prepared himself and equipped himself so that he then could become the sacrifice of mankind by which he would pay the price for which we had done wrong. Jesus, part of God's plan. He would be obedient to that plan and that obedience would take Him to the cross where there He would sacrifice Himself on the cross to pay the price of my sin, to pay the price of my disobedience, to pay the price of my breaking the law of God. Jesus would reveal the Father Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law. The demands of the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And because He fulfilled the law, because He willingly sacrificed Himself on the cross, He was able to extend to us grace. 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 Receiving what we don't deserve. Grace upon grace, it tells us in this passage. That because Jesus was obedient to the Father, because He revealed the Father, because He was the light that shines the path to the Father, 
Jesus, through His sacrifice, through His obedience, made a way for us to be forgiven. Made a way for us to inherit eternal life. That which we do not deserve. Jesus extends to us now a sacrifice that was accepted by God as payment in full, a sacrifice that revealed God's final plan for mankind in bringing about the salvation of man's soul. So that then if we by faith would say, Jesus, I know I need you as my Savior. Because I have broken the law. I've broken the commandments of God. And therefore, I can't get to heaven on my own. The Bible says we've all sinned and therefore we fall short of God's glorious standard. The standard of perfection required to get to heaven. We can't get there on our own. Even as Mickey showed us last week... We, we can't earn this salvation. We can't achieve it on our own. We have no part in it. God did everything to provide a means by which we could be adopted into His family. And so now, God is calling us to Himself. You say, well, Tom, what in the world do I need to do? I mean, what do I do with information like this? For some of us, we've been born into the family of God already. We've we trusted Christ to be our Lord and Savior. And so, therefore, what, what we need to do today maybe is, first of all, just check to see if there's anything in our lives that shouldn't be there. Have I allowed things to creep into my life that has no business being in my life? And if so, then I just need to confess it to God. Maybe from there, then, I need to look and see, okay, am I doing what I need to be doing? Namely, one thing in particular, am I being a witness? Am I sharing Christ with other people? Am I telling people in my family, in my neighborhood, at work, at school, am I telling them about Jesus? If not, then I need to confess that is sin because God has given us all a commandment that we are to make disciples. And then I move forward to do what God's called me to do. This Thursday evening, 6.30, we're going to have a class right next door in the fellowship hall for anyone who wants to come and learn how to share their faith with courage. It's just going to be a means of learning how to be, uh, do evangelism in an enjoyable way. It's not, it's not the hard-nosed preaching and screaming and spitting. It's just it's learning to do it in a way that is actually enjoyable. If you'd like to be part of that, we'd love to have you here this Thursday. One-hour class. There will be four of those that are tied together over the weeks. I'd love for you to come and be part of it this Thursday. For others, maybe, maybe your situation is different. You don't know Christ as your Savior. And so what you would do with this information is just come to the place where you recognize your need of a Savior. And right now, I believe there are some in the audience who, who kind of feel in a tug of war going on inside. You kind of feel a wrestling match happening and you don't really know what's happening, why it's happening. Can I tell you that that's God drawing you to Himself? Our old nature is not willing to let go of that just yet. God wants to have us. He wants wants us to be part of Him. And so this morning, the way you would respond to this would just be, when I ask you to stand in a few minutes and worship team sings would be for you just to step out to the aisle that's closest to you and just come and meet me here at the front I'm not going to embarrass you I'm not going to point you out I'm not going to call your name but I'll have someone trained in God's word show you how you can know Christ as your Savior today if you want to
decision is ultimately yours. But we'll share that information with you. If you'd like to know more about being a child of God, can I invite you and encourage you to come and see me here in just a couple of minutes? Would you do that? Really what I'm asking is for you just to honor God. Just to do what God wants you to do.